Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's house today. It is good to see you. Are you glad to see you? I hope so. And I hope you're glad to see those that are around you today. Um, TB's coming with an announcement for us today. We do well, I wanted to make a quick announcement. It's uh, that time of year again uh, for our 8th annual PHC Hall coming up. Um, that's coming up on uh, Saturday, March the 2nd, starting at 530 in the Fellowship Hall. So <clears throat> I'll make more detailed announcements later. <clears throat> but what I needed to announce today is that if you are interested in being in the entertainment part, and we will take anybody, whether you've ever done it or not, if you want to be in there, we will put you in there doing something. Um, please meet with me here in the choir, and I promise it will be very brief, just a couple of minutes. Uh, I want to give out the, the schedules, uh, talk about practice. Um, so if you're interested at all in being involved in the entertainment at PHC Hall, please meet me up here right after service. Thank you. Also, we're coming to the end of a, a, a called fast that I have called for the church. I pray that this has been beneficial to you. But I pray it will start your year well. This is just January. I know it feels like we're so far so far down the road. But this is just January. So there's a lot of 2024 left to live. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be done this year. I want to see God move in a special way in 2024. That's just a high uh, bar that I'm putting up there. And I, I want to see it happen. I don't want to see things be exactly as they were. I want to see them change for the better in your family and in our family's life as well. Are you in agreement with that? Would you like to see change this year? blessings this year instead of the difficulties we're so accustomed to. I think that's worthy for us to look to this year. I want to ask you to stand. I had a reminder today of the blessings that we have. Sometimes we overlook them. We read from the scripture, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, we have everything we need to live a life that pleases God. Just let that one sink in. You don't need one thing. You don't have to go to a store. You have it in God. It was all given to us by God's own power when we learned that He had invited us to share in His wonderful goodness. So that means three things according to this card. Three things for every one of us. God has created you and rejoices in all that you are. There's a lot of it. There should have been a little more amens out of that one. Maybe you don't think that you lighten the heart of God, but how you live is seen by your Creator. He's not unaffected. He is affected by your lives. He rejoices in all that you are. God has chosen you. Amen. Amen. Ooh, we got to warm up this morning. We're cold as Pentecostals this morning. We got to do a little stretching. Got to get a little going. He's chosen you. He's called you His very own. Amen. Not a stepchild. You are a child of the living God. Hallelujah. God has blessed you and made your life a blessing. Blessed be God. Father, as we go to your throne today as a community, God, we are overwhelmed by the truth of what you have revealed to us. That we are not simply just beings on a planet full of other living beings and just existing until the day of our departure. No, God's, no God, our lives are sparks of light filling up the darkness of this universe. We are living by your grace and we are empowered by your own spirit. We are not things, we are the children of God. We are yours called by your name. There is already not only just a name written in glory that has us, but God even greater that you've written your name on us. So God, while one day the devil will, will mimic that by, by putting his number, the number of the beast on people, God, all he's doing is mimicking you who have already been marked out by your own name, your children. We don't belong to him. We belong to you. So, Father, we thank you this day 
Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for all that you are doing. But dear God, I want to emphasize that last part too. Thank you, dear God, that you've blessed us and you've made us a blessing. God, our lives affect other people's lives for the good. And dear God, there may be evil in this world, but evil has not overcome good. And we are very thankful to be a part of the good that you are wielding in this world. Dear God, this is your service. We humbly, respectfully bow before you and ask you to sovereignly oversee every song, every word, every act of worship in this house that God, when all is said and done, the only word that we think of is to God be the glory. Great things He has done. Father, be with your people this day and your people now desire to praise your name. These things we pray and offer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen to that. Amen. <laughs> the song writer says, Great and mighty is the Lord our God. He is great, He is mighty, He is awesome. How many of you agree that this morning? Lift your hands and say, How great our God is. Amen. Let's sing that chorus as we open this morning. Praise His holy name.
holy name. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. The Bible says, after him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be glory and majesty and power and authority before all the times, now and forever. I said, Jude, I challenge the class this morning to read you. Why do we praise and glorify our God this morning? Because He inhabits the praises of His people. You didn't come this morning just for yourself. You come to worship, right? But I got this need, I got that need, right? We all have these. The Bible warns us that, right? It also, they give us a place to come as a church, as a congregation, as a assembly before God in His presence. Like the pastor told us just a few moments ago, the mighty God who created everything you see and know and made salvation for us through Jesus Christ and His shed blood. He's right here with us. Would you give Him a little praise this morning? He says, Oh, let Lord of your presence.
morning. Most of us, Sunday mornings are quite a routine. I'm not saying they're not hectic, but they're, they're routine all in all. But how many, honestly, you can be honest, and if, it, if you can't raise your hand, that's fine. How many of you, it was truly some of a struggle? I'm not saying you had to cross the Grand Canyon today, but it was a struggle to get the Lord's test. It wasn't just easy and it wasn't routine. Anybody this morning? Sick or, or hard, have a hard time getting to, to, to the house of God this morning? I see several. Praise God for His presence that undergirds us. It, it's, it's, it costs us something. And it, it's a challenge for others to come. That is the strength of God's presence. There's no benefit here in this church but the presence of God. He is the bonus. He is the benefit. He is the blessing. And it's worth these by their very presence. These have said it's it's worth it. I see Brother Richard back there. He was I, he was just one Sunday off. That that is why he he tried last week. He is here this Sunday. Post knee surgery. You, Miss Dawn, you you a rocket yet? Yeah. You know, Y'all know what a rocket is. You know the kid kind of high. So I'm I'm seeing if she's got that level yet. She's getting there. So. Praise God. God takes us through our struggles and He brings us out on the other side. I don't know about you, but, but I, I, know, I know I haven't lived some of this journey as long as you have, but I would rather have God in the midst of my struggle than not have God on the best of days. Because my God is faithful. And I have found the benefit He brings to me is well worth any struggle I ever know. Anybody else? Surely the presence covenant 
of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Lord God, I ask you to bless the word of God today before us. We know this word is perfect, that it has the truth, the, the accurate description of life, and understand that we need, God, we need this. We need to understand. We need to walk in and we need to abide by the truth. So mighty God, would you speak to us today? Would you speak to our needs through the scripture today? Dear God, when all is said and done, give us something to walk in, walk by, and walk under. Dear Father, we may be pleasing to you in this week. By your grace, we have been granted to come. And we honor you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Now we've been talking about this particular life in Israel's history. And, and um, again, it's, it's, it's a very different one for the beginning of the year. It wasn't not my first choice at all. But there's some there's things going on here that I think are so relevant to us. I, I do understand uh, the Lord's thinking here. We've been talking about how the Lord is coming at this in a relationship type of fashion. This is not, it's not been really presented as the sovereign God who is so awesome the heavens cannot contain it. But it's more of an interpersonal relationship here. It's, it's become very one-on-one -on -one almost. You can feel it from that very earliest one where God says, I've loved you. So I'm really talking about a personal relationship here. We've seen the problems that has gone on on Israel's side between he and God. And this chapter continues that. But it comes at it almost like a betrayal. A heartbreak that is rooted in abandonment. And so I, I, that began to get me to think. Now, I'm, I'm going to pattern myself a little after Steve Turner today. So, buckle up. Uh, but Steve Turner, you talked to him for, for, for a few minutes, and, and he's got a favorite saying. If you've been around him, you already know what I'm going to say. But he talks about the Eustace. Now, I don't know if you understand that word. That's, that's, that's southern for used to. Or at one time. Or what things used to be. And basically, that's a standard that he uses to look at everything he's going through in his modern contemporary world through the lens of how it used to be. Well, I'm going to kind of use that in my own way. Instead of the Eustus, I'm going to use the August. So is, that, is that okay? Is, it, is that all right? Pattern a little bit out? Okay, he gives he, permission so I can go on here. Autos. Now, we know what autos ought to be, too, don't we? So, I can, I can put a blank after a lot of sentences and something comes to your mind. I'm going to pick on couples first. My husband ought to... And you got an answer, don't you? I see smiles, see? <laughs> a wife ought to... You all see, I see more smiles. There is an answer that comes up in your head. Those children ought to... You got an answer, don't you? We could say presidents ought to, and we've got an answer, don't we? Society ought to. So in our mind, there is this innate understanding that things ought to be a certain way. There is an ought to it. So there's an understanding that, yes, this may be the way things are, this is how it exists, but there ought to be something else. There's a standard in our hearts that we don't even know that's there. There is a bar up there that we may not come up to ourselves and we'll say, oh, I'm far from perfect. But we are also at the same time know this is how it ought to be. A standard above all. And as I'm reading this interaction between God and Israel, but in particular the tribe of Levi, for a reason that really matters to us, God is saying, you ought to be this way. I mean, I mean, look with me very quickly. He said, for the lips of a priest should be this way. This is the way it should be. And I, I could put that in my language. A priest ought to be this. He ought to do this. He ought to have this in his life. And so that is my particular uh, focus today. The oughts. And when things don't act as they ought to, it's hurtful. Now, I'm not one for TV dramas. And I'm not talking about the scripted ones. I'm talking about the so-called unscripted <laughs> ones that uh, uh, show how people act. It used to be the the, the Phil Donahue's back in the day. Boy, I'm really pulling back then. But then it moved up to the Jerry Springers, and now it's just YouTube. Just, just, just there. 
Um, people show things as they ought not be. And you see things like that. You see relationship issues. You look at divorce court. Why do we ever put that on TV? I don't understand. You see all kind of litigation played out on TV. You're, you, the standards are here's what it ought to be. And here we're going. We're not looking for things what they ought to be. We're going to look at the things and see how messy they can get. But those things really hurt. They're not entertainment. They hurt. They're ugly. Some people like to watch us with other people's ugly. I guess it makes them feel better about their lives. But ugly is ugly. And there's a lot of things in our world that ought not be. Because they're hurtful. They're damaging. They are destructive. And so I, I look at those and I'm not, I, I, may, may, I may question the setting there. But there are real hurts that happen between couples, between families, between neighbors, between co-workers, between societies. And it is, it is something that we just have to acknowledge is real, but something we should work for the how things ought to be. Because the hurt that can stain from those ought not to be is, is truly lasting. I see that, especially in these verses. God is saying, I have done so much. Here's what you ought to have been. I have been so much for you. Here's what it ought to be. So it's almost like a, a jilted lover. It's almost like a, a family breakup. It's almost like the hurt and the pain of these things not being what they ought to be is played out right here in front of us. And some people wrongly believe, well, this can't be true because God has no feelings. Who told you God has no feelings? Your imagination may not believe that. You may not can understand that. But my belief is I have feelings because my God has feelings. I act like this because my God acts like this. And as I read the scriptures, I see words associated with God having feelings and not being this immovable being who nothing ever touched. I realize He's God. And I realize He's perfect. But that does not mean that God doesn't understand what we go through. In fact, the opposite. He knows in every way that we go through. But He just knows how to handle it without sin. So how do we get to that ought to of the Lord? There's, there's three things He shares here, which is a wonderful pattern, not only for the life of Levi, but it's a wonderful pattern for the church as well. Three things, two things before the third, is, is what we ought to have before we get to that ideal in number three. The first thing that ought to happen is something ought to happen between us and God. Amen. I'm not talking about you and your church. I'm not talking about you and your family. Something ought to happen between you and God. The problem, a lot of the problem with the church today is there's things that have happened culturally in the name of Christ, but some folks hasn't had anything happen to them between them and God, and there is the problem. It becomes a severe problem when a church doesn't act like the founder, when it doesn't act with the power of the founder because it doesn't even know the founder. Isn't that sad to say? Preacher, there's no people in church that are part of the church that don't know God. How long have you been in church? Because I've been in long enough to know that's exactly right. I already know what it's like even as a believer to move away from God. Now what have I done? I may call myself in God, but if I'm moving away from Him, I'm not acting as I ought to. What has happened between us is being strange. First picture here, TV. He said, I had a covenant with him. Now, covenant is agreement. Levi, we got an agreement. Now, I'm making an agreement with you. I'm not making any other tribes. Judah, love Judah. Son's going to come through Judah. You're not priests. Manasseh, wonderful people. Love you. You're not going to be priests. The other tribes, all the other 11 tribes, none of them would be priests. Not one. Levi, we had an agreement. Me and you. And you will come into my presence once a year. You will come before the holy presence of God. And I've got to tell you how that's possible because you're treading on dangerous ground when you're treading on holy ground. The closer you get to God, the more immortal peril you are. So we're going to have to work on that. But that's my agreement. I'm, I'm making a way from you to leave the masses and to walk into the holy place of God 
to walk into the most holy place and to be at my very presence. That's the covenant, the deal, the agreement I have made with you. Yes. Ah, what a wonderful agreement. Now they weren't supposed to do the things other people do. You, you can't act like everybody else. You've got to act special because this is our deal. Me and you, we've got an agreement. We've got a covenant. So whatever is left for you, you won't build houses, you won't build fields, you won't own cities, but I'll provide for you hey. everything you need. Right. What a covenant. What an agreement. Uh, but that is essential. And he said, here's what I've given to you. I've given you a covenant of life and of peace. You're going to live because of me. Now that's impossible. This was given in a desert <laughs> with a certain amount of food. And your food income is going to be based on other people's faithfulness. What? <laughs> you mean I can't provide? No. Other people's faithfulness to me is going to provide for your need. You mean i got to live and walk by faith? By every meal, by every day, by everything you do, you're going to have to trust me. You know what? It worked. Yeah. He gave them life, and life is not just existence. We think life, well, I'm breathing, i got life. You may have existence, but you don't have life. You see, life has meaning. Life has purpose. And Levi wasn't just given existence like the other tribes. They lived in the presence of God. They wore holy robes in the presence of God. They had experiences with God that nobody else did because of their covenant with God. He gave them life. He gave them meaning. He gave them purpose. And there's too many, even in the house of God, they're existing, but they're not living. Because when you have a, a something that ought to be between you and God, life is going to break out of you. Yeah. It can't help but to. He is the source of life. It's like putting your finger in a light socket and not and, and expecting nothing to happen. No, you do that. Well, you'd be Pentecostal in about the next 15 seconds. <laughs> God is the source of life. To be around Him and to be dead is nonsensical. I will give you life. But He gives that other crucial thing to our existence. He said, I'm going to give you peace. Oh, God, how much has taken away our peace? COVID took our peace. Politics have taken our peace. Trouble has taken our peace. The church not being ascended has taken our peace. But God didn't say, my peace is based on your circumstances, on your politics, or on anything in this world. Your peace comes from me. You can have it when nothing else is going right in your life. And Levi, they may be unfaithful, but you can have peace. I will be faithful to you. I give you peace. Perfect, God-given holy peace. And we still need those things. Yes. Yes. Still do. A person with life that's really living their life and enjoying the, the joy that comes from living and peace, that's a strong person. That's a moving person. That's a powerful person in the church. But notice why he gave it. He said, I gave it to him that he might fear me. You see, I want a relationship, and I want this relationship right. I want him to respect me. I want him to know I'm not his, his friend. I am God, but I invite him to come close. He, he, he knows if he comes at the wrong time before my presence, he's dead. But he also knows once a year I'm opening it up. And he can come right in with the smoke of the praise from the, from the altar and the blood that he's bringing with it. He can come before God and be mere inches away from the God of all glory. Wow. He wants a respectful relationship. And then he says, he'll be reverent before my name. He'll serve me like I am the center of his life and not just the part. I am the center. That's what ought to happen if we're going to get to the ideal. You can't get to that ideal unless you believe in that ideal to start with. Some Christians have too low a bar. That's why we don't raise to the heights that we have previously ascended to. Number two, after it ought to happen to see something between us and God, there ought to be a life we practice. My family can't stay out of the doctors here lately. And I guess it started with me. All right, blame it on me. Uh, we're still going through that process, thankfully not with doctors, though I'm, 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 I'm concerned. <laughs> we might see one still yet. But it was funny, and I think it was when we took Leah to the, the doctor. Our, our doctor sat there, and he was trying to, to figure out all the things already done. He says, 
You know we still do practice medicine. And I thought that was, I thought that was, that was refreshingly open for a doctor. Because we look at them, you're the expert, you know everything that's wrong with me. So, so, A, B, C, put it together. But how many of you know that's not experience, that's, that's not a real experience in doctors. Maybe sometimes they do act like they've got all the answers. And you get home and say, doctor, this ain't working. This is making it worse. You see, they're still practicing. And, and those that, that are really skilled at their, what they do, they know that. They know they don't have all the answers. They don't know everything. They know what should work in this range or in this way. It should work this way, but it don't always work that way. They practice medicine, so they, do, they use their skills to the best that they can. Well, we've got to practice being Christians. We've got to actually live it out. It's not stuff we put in our heads and then tell everybody else this is what you should do. No, it's what we live out. If Christ is Christ, if He's the, the Lord of all, the first thing we do is not tell everybody else what He says. The first thing we do is follow Him and mimic ourselves after Him. He says in the second part, the law of truth was in His mouth. Isn't that interesting? That once he had a relationship, something happened in his heart, but how did it come out? It came out of his mouth. So let me ask you, don't answer me, is what's coming out of your heart that subtly exits your mouth, is it the truth of God? If it's not, let's take a step back to step one. There ought to be something between us and God, and then it ought to be practiced. It ought to be lived out in our lives. The law of truth was in his mouth. Injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and in equity. In, in, in truth and in justice in the right way, he walked with me. He didn't just say it, he lived it. I can't, I can't understand. I can't understand Christians that don't live it out. I'm a Christian, but I don't ever do anything for God. How? How can you do that? You've got to find someone. Maybe your way is not my way. Maybe it is different ways. But how can you do nothing for God? You've got to do it if you truly had something with Him. And He shows this is the way you walked before me. You, you spoke the right words. Let the words that we say to our kids be the law of God and the truth of God. Let the word we say to our neighbor be the truth of God. Let the words we say to our brothers and our sisters, let it be the truth of God. We're living in an age of fake news. Let there be nothing fake about the church of Jesus Christ. Let it be all true or don't say it. Amen. We've had enough of the world rightly criticizing us because our mouths have not lined up with the truth that we say we proclaim. I've heard too many say, yeah, Christians, they sure do love talking about heaven, but none of them want to go. <clears throat> Because we fight tooth and nail to stay alive. So are we really looking forward to heaven? That's just one way. I know that's a simple way. And I know we're all human. But if we know God, shouldn't that affect how we live? I think it does. I think it should. Tomorrow I'm going to the courthouse. I'm not in trouble, Sheriff. I'm not. This is. The, I don't mind going to the courthouse tomorrow. Most happy occasion I've ever had to go to a courthouse. I'm gaining a new cousin Full adoption is done tomorrow, and we will stand on those court steps and we will celebrate the inclusion of a brand new family member. Can I tell you, that's not just a legal precedent, that's a spiritual precedent. The Bible says we have been adopted. So we're celebrating an earthly tie that will end at death, but God said, I have made an eternal truth. If you grab hold of this, I will adopt you into my family, and you will have the rights and privileges of a child of God. Now, if we can't live by that, I don't know what else we can live by. But the next time I start complaining about my situation, I better remember who I am and what He expects of me. You, so you think I'm not going to provide for you? So you think I'm not going to do for you? What have I done before? He's always provided. He has always been there. Here's my second picture, Brother TV. The true determining factor, Beth Moore says, of our belief system is not what we're saying, but how we're living. Don't tell me what you believe. That, there's a time for that. Show me. Because what you live by is what you really, really believe. Levi, this is how they were living. And notice also 
They turned people away from iniquity. They came to these people and trusted them with their problems. And they told them what? Here's what the Lord says. <coughs> well, preacher, that's not popular. Well, I looked at Israel's history. It wasn't very popular then either. They kind of didn't like the Word of God. But it says... When God was moving in a special way, they were turning people from iniquity. Church, keep telling the truth. Yeah. Even if it costs you. Yeah. Even if they say, I don't want to hear that no more. Tell them. Don't bombard them. Don't, don't, make, don't make the Word of God, uh, you know, it, the sharing of it itself be a burden. But tell them the truth and make sure they're not ignorant of it. It's life or death. It truly is. And to turn away from iniquity, that's not an Old Testament principle. That's a Bible principle. James said, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, sounds the same way as the Old Testament, and someone turns him back. Well, we got to stop right there. Some people don't want to turn him back. Some people want to tell him to go away. Not 96 church. Thank God for that. And if you or I do it, we're going to call each other on the carpet, right? Because we don't do that. We don't do that around here. He says, you turn them back. Let them know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Living out this Christian life makes a difference. And it makes a difference to other people as well. And so then we finally get to that ideal of what should be. Christians ought to be known that person. When I look at them, I think that's what a Christian should be. That's a hard burden, church. And to be honest with you, we don't want it. We would rather say, well, go talk to my preacher. Or, or go see brother and sister so-and-so. My Bible doesn't say that. My Bible says you are the light of the world. And that's plural. You are the city that set up on the hill. If you're not lit up, that's not God's fault. And you can't flick it off and say, that's not my responsibility. No, this is what He's made you. Embrace it. It's hard. It's challenging. But if something between you and Him, it's got to be lived out and you will get there if you let God have His way with your life. It's a being. What should a Christian be? He should share truth in verse 7. He should... Store it inside of him. It should come out of him. You shouldn't have to look it up. Find it. Know it. And people should seek the law from his mouth. Some of you have had this experience and it shows what God is doing through you. They don't want to hear from you most times, but they get in trouble and they come to you. Could you, could you tell me what I'm to do? Now why do they come to you? Because Christ is in you. And you're His representative. And you're supposed to be spoken to. That's why if I'm in a foreign country and I get in trouble, who am I going to talk to? I'm going to talk to, to my country, my emissary, my ambassador. Help me out. I'm in trouble. So if there's people that are lost, they should be able to come to you. And you don't direct them to somebody else. You're the light. You're the source. You're the one helping them. That's God's call. And He's got ambassadors everywhere. For He or she is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. But they don't like that today, preacher. I know they don't like it. And they're determined to get rid of it. Oh, I know that. But you see, they don't control history. They don't control this world. They may say what they want very loudly over the power the world's given them. Can I tell you? God's going to have His way. It says He will control the earth that now mankind is trying to control. He will control the population that everybody's trying to control. And in fact, it says that every knee, every knee is going to bow. That means Muslim knees. That means Hindu knees. That means atheist knees are going to hit the floor. They're going to look at him and they're going to declare something they said they would never do. They will declare he's Lord. Why? Because that's God's will. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. We should speak for the Lord. That's why you're here. It's what ought to be done. My last picture for the TV. When you look in the mirror of your life, what do you see? Because let me start with this one. When God looks at you, 
he sees a priest. What? Now that was Levi. Mm -mm. Let me update you, child of God. Revelation 1.6. He has made us kings and priests to God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You have now been inducted into the priesthood of God. Some people want that kingship. They like telling everybody what to do. Now, now you're not there yet. Till the crown comes, grace. Grace and mercy, not judgment. But now priests. You are a priest. So get into the most holy place. Amen, preacher. Get with him. Let something transpire between you two. Let something happen in your heart. Let him build that flame in you again. And if the altar fires are not burning, don't look to God. Say, here is my altar. Here is my sacrifice. God, let the fire of God fall again in my life. We can say, oh, God, fall on the church. What we really mean, God, fall on everybody else and I'll jump in. God, let it fall on me. Let me be the flame. John Wesley said, if you will get on fire with God, the world will come and watch you burn. I want to burn. I don't want to be silent. And then walk out of that place and serve the people of God with the truth of God. That's what a priest does. When they speak, they don't lie. If you lie, get up here in this altar and quit that garbage. A priest does not lie. You speak the truth of God. You store it. Well, I don't know what to say. Well, you better get busy. There's Genesis to Revelation. There's plenty of Bible reading plans. Take your time. Let it soak in. So when it soaks in, it'll come out. But you know it. The truth will set you free. It'll set others free too. Let it come out. Speak for the Lord. You are His priest. This is how you ought to be. I conclude with this story. Francis Asbury followed a call that was given out to ministers in England long ago in John Wesley's time. And he said, go to America and evangelize those heathen. You know, our forebears. <laughs> they were heathen. Georgia was a prison colony. They're still watch out. They'll bust you in a heartbeat. In <laughs> Georgia, some things don't change. Evangelize them. They need. Wesley came and he failed. Everything he did was just a failure. He had to go home and it didn't work. But he called others to go out. Francis Asbury is one of those that said, Yes, I will go and I will evangelize the people of the Americas. He got here in the long, arduous trip and he stayed sick most of the time. Now, what happens when good Christian folk get sick? We stop the work of God. You leave it up to somebody else. He kept a journal doing his ministry. And throughout it, he records he was frequently ill. Headaches, toothaches, sore throats, swollen feet, and an undiagnosed sickness that put him in bed sometimes for days. So Francis Asbury, he's just a pitiful life. I mean, what can come with such a life? I mean, yeah, you may want to do a lot, but you can't because you're always sick. Because sickness is a deal breaker. You're not expected to go. Well, let me read you one of his journal entries. He says, I have been sick near 10 months. Yet I have preached 300 times and rode near 2,000 miles. Ought to be versus what is comfortable. Hmm. He declared in his journal, what a miracle of grace I am. There's a reason why we have an Asbury Seminary. It's because this man gave his life speaking the truth of Jesus Christ. And to this day, 200 years later, that truth is still preached and trained and, and it speaks throughout the church. <coughs> Ought to be? Hmm. That sounds kind of like what we ought to be. It's not denying the struggles we have, but it's saying I've gotten something from God and it's going to get out of me and I am going to be an example in my own little circumstance of not what's comfortable for me. Because that's where we all naturally evolve. My daughter, precious daughter is learning. You know, high school was one thing, college. Whew, that's rougher. 
But you know what I found with young people, and I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to believe the same of adults, but sometimes we adults let me down, including myself. I have found that kids rise to the level of their expectation. You hear me this morning? You expect nothing of them, they'll make sure. They'll make sure to do that for you. But I spent Friday night watching a band here in 96. You were made to do a lot of things, Braden, you and your cohorts. You were expected a lot of. And they just won first place in Dorman just Saturday. They were expected a lot. And they performed a lot. Why? Because here's where it's comfortable. But here's the ideal. Somebody knows we ought to get to, and they were right. So we as adults... Do we live to the level of our comfort or do we level to the ideal, the ought to, rather than the easy to? Would you stand? It's time for prayer. Please continue to remember Sister Delane. <laughs> she's struggling. Um, hopefully she's coming back this way soon because she's tired of being cared for. She's independent, but um, she's still having some physical struggles related to the surgery. Just pray this thing will be over and that everything will be well. Um, I do believe it's a spiritual battle. I, I truly believe that. God called her police and, and now she's on her back and just can't get better and didn't even come back home. That's 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 has all the hallmarks to me of a spiritual battle. So let's let's do pray for her. Are there other needs on your heart you would like to share? If you would like to come forward and be anointed for somebody or, or, or have us pray together. If, if you have a desire to commit to God, not what you easily can do, but what you ought to do, I invite you to come up here too and, and receive that from God. And if you're not even following God, let me tell you, there's a broad path right now and everybody's hopping on. It doesn't matter how many people's on it. Theologian said, if you're running the opposite way of the crowd that's fixing to run off the cliff, you will be the one called crazy. At least until the cliff. And then you'll be the only wise one. There's a broad path, and there you're jumping off into hell. Let's not be sorry that we're not popular. Let's be sorry that so many people are not being impacted by the gospel. Let's pray. People start turning. And I don't mind starting the, the progression in the opposite way. So let's pray for those, even maybe in this room, that haven't chosen the narrow way, the only way of God that's eternal. Any other requests that you may want to mention? How about? Father, we're just going to conclude this prayer today for every person that is in need, physically, relationships, maybe economics employment. Dear God, we're putting them at your feet and use the facets of their life to bring about change in their spiritual life so that with a wholeness, dear God, they may live their life, that there's not sacred and secular, but there's only God that is in but also works through. And dear Father, we, we also pray not only for the individual prayers and the faces and the hands lifted up, we pray for our dedication here. For we've heard the word of God and we've seen the ideal of God put before us. The ought to. So dear God, we understand rightly that your ought to is impossible for us. So Father, by your grace, would you help us to ascend to that level? Because you said you would. You said that he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So this is not my belief you will do it. It's your promise that you will. But God, I want you to. I'm not going to fight you. And I don't, I don't desire the people of God to fight you here. I desire for our surrender to be unanimous. God, I don't know what you're going to put on us. I don't know what path we'll tread. But let it be by the power of God, the grace of God, and let it be by the movement of God through us. Father, if there's any sin hindering us today, we confess our sins and say, forgive us. That you may forgive us of all of our sins this very day. And as we walk out of this house, we leave them. We don't take them. We leave them because they don't exist. And we don't hold to the things that are gone, the things that are forgiven and forgotten. We hold on to the truth. And the truth is those who confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their hearts that God raised Him from the dead, they are saved. And dear God, help us to live that saved life by your mercy, by your grace, and oh God, 
by that Holy Spirit power that we so desperately need. We pray and we believe these things in Jesus' holy name. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. May God be with you and bless you this day as you go.